Hey guys, how's everyone doing in the Star Wars community? It's your boy Coast, uh, <clears throat> and I am ecstatic this Resurrection Sunday. It would seem that everything's going well. Uh, the Star Wars Legends community, we have news of, uh, well, we have news of new Legends materials being, well, Legends materials being reprinted. Uh, I wouldn't say new Legends material because uh, that hasn't been announced yet. But the uh, uh, apparently Disney is now paying attention. Uh, we have their attention, and with the High Republic and the warm reception that it's received, um, who knows? We might be receiving new Legends material. Who knows? Hopefully we don't get another, we don't get too many rocks. <laughs> we don't get too many rocks. <laughs> uh, seriously, guys, like, they had, they, this is what they want to replace the Old Republic. I hope you guys are happy. You guys are, were all psyched up for uh, freaking uh, High Republic and... Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, freaking um what's it called you see i can't even remember the name now uh fallen order yeah you see no hardly anyone remembers that game um fallen order oh my god fallen order it's so good oh <laughs> faded out of almost faded out of memory and it's like how do you rec how do you reconcile the two how do you reconcile having such trash and then like I just I know people like this. They ha they have such trash uh, in, in the Disney side of things, and then they keep running back to it. Like why? And they can they they complain about these things too. They complain, oh, episode seven, eight, and nine. Oh, they weren't that great. Oh, the prequels and the and the stuff were better. But I still love my Disney though. Like yeah, you know, I'll still watch the Mandalorian. Like no, like no, bro. You've got to be. I, I will probably only watch The Mandalorian to review it um, and give you a general sense of what I think of the series, but I mean, honestly, I don't feel like giving any money to this company. As long as I'm not paying Disney uh, to watch it, then I guess it'll be all good. Let's talk a little bit about canon, alright? Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what these guys consider canon oh everyone is 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 uh who is a disney stan is like oh the eu is never canon look at this article right here oh wait a minute where is it whatever happened to this wired article now you see I think this is what they're trying to do they're trying to censor uh, anything that might that might point towards the expanded universe being canon um, they are now censoring actively censoring it um, because before you were able to see the entire article and now it's just this I guess it's behind a paywall but let's enter it into the Wayback Machine let's see what's going on here so apparently as soon as last year it was not modified like this
And this is how it looked. Oh, the cannon, the cannon. Meet Leland Chi, the Star Wars franchise continuity cop. This was in 2008. All right. 2008. Oh, it was never canon. We love hearing that argument. And every single time I will point to this, I have this saved as a PDF. So please, please try. Try harder. <laughs> All right, let's see how many times canon comes up in this article. Keeping it canonical. Leland Chi is continuity database administrator at Lucas Licensing. All right, kids, you understand what that means? That means that he is in charge of keeping track of everything that was in the EU because it was canon and making sure that it doesn't conflict with the main story that George Lucas wanted to tell. It's, it's like... It's rocket science. They treat it like it's rocket science when it's really not. It's really simple. George Lucas, he wanted to have a six part story that's his main story. All right. Anything else, you know, yeah, you can, you can expand on my story and it'll be canon. That's how he treated it. He treated it as canon. He wrote the story. He wrote some stories for, for, uh, Sotor and uh, I mean, not, not Sotor, but for, uh, for the um, Force Unleashed, he wrote that. He uh, basically designed and wrote the character uh, of Star Killer. Uh, you know, his influence in the EU is all over the place. All right, let's see. Retail sales of merchandise stand at fifteen billion dollars, and twenty percent of that has been earned since two thousand six, the year. The final film was released. Careful, well, 2005. Careful nurture of the Star Wars canon. Canon, thousands of years of story time. Running all through all the bits and pieces of merchandise. It's kept the franchise popular for decades. Okay. But hey, maybe you don't believe me. Maybe you'll believe these guys. I don't know. They seem pretty authoritative on the subject. Back in the summer of 2004, uh, we knew that we wanted to start working on a next generation Star Wars game. And with a galaxy as deep and as large as Star Wars, the opportunities are almost endless. We would go and we would just watch the movies and then get back together and say, okay, what types of characters did we like? What types of things really resonated for us? What are the things that were referenced that haven't been explored yet that we want to explore? So it was actually, we didn't have a shortage of ideas. It was whittling down to the right idea ranging from a, a Wookiee uh, freedom fighter. We looked at games centered around some of the main characters, so a Darth Maul game, for example. Some, some we were more intrigued with than others, but nonetheless, we really wanted to get input from George. But nonetheless, we really wanted to get input from George. He laid out that there were things that you had to hit uh, in a Star Wars story, that you had to have adventure, that you had to have humor. And then we show him the next the next presentation is this Wookiee game, and he looks at it and he goes, so I just spent 45 minutes talking to you about the importance of drama, and you present me a game concept where the main character doesn't talk? So he, he wasn't a big fan of the Wookiee game, but he understood what we were going for in terms of a superhero type character in the Star Wars universe. A lot of the early Star Wars concepts revolved around gadgets and tricked out spaceships. But it just got outside the realm of what really felt organic to Star Wars and the brand of Star Wars and the, the, the canon. The, the, the canon. George is all about, you know, fundamental gameplay. And so immediately when he saw that, that was that was what we were going to do. When he saw that, that was that was what we were going to do. He allowed us to give 
Darth Vader, a secret apprentice, which from a canon standpoint, from a canon standpoint, is just fantastic. It is such a rich character opportunity. Um, he's got a great love interest in, in Juno Eclipse, so it's not just blowing things up and, and unleashing the force on everyone, it's the consequences of those actions as seen through the eyes of Juno. So that gives an emotional weight uh, that's crucial to delivering a, a Star Wars experience. That, those are elements that the George always made sure we were hitting. That, those are elements that the George always made sure we were hitting. And if we came up short on one of them, he didn't hesitate in pointing them out. We could bounce ideas off of him. We could bounce ideas off of him. And he could tell us, nah, I wouldn't go there, but did you ever think about this? Or, hey, why don't you create this new character, which was fantastic, because all of a sudden that opened up the cannon. And that opened up the cannon. That opened up the cannon. When we all kind of took a look at it, it was one of those moments where, yeah, that's it. That's the game we want to make. That, that would rock. That video was incredibly important because it got all of us excited about, yeah, this is something that's going to be a great game. We were able to show it to George, and he was, yep, that's it, go make that. We were able to show it to George, and he was, yep, that's it, go make that. But as Hayden likes to point out, the scary part was, once he said yes, oh my god, we had to go deliver on that, and that's what we've been doing the last couple of years. The basic premise, Hayden speaks to this all the time, and he makes us all say it in every meeting. You know, what's the premise of the game? Kicking someone's ass with the force. What is the core gameplay? Kicking someone's ass with the force. Once we had that core foundation, we also could go off and begin to write a wonderful Star Wars story. It is a rich, deep Star Wars story that fits right in the continuity between Episode 3 and Episode 4. The galaxy is on the brink of darkness. The evil galactic empire has overthrown the old republic and now holds countless worlds in the grip of fear. Because of George's schedule, we had to actually put the story and the outline in a memo form to George. It was a day when, you know, we heard that the fax was coming and everybody rushed around the fax machine. We just stood there looking at the fax machine, waiting for it to come out. And the pages start coming through and then the machine jammed and we're, ah, you know, running to get new paper and fix it. And, and, and you know, so we actually have this great crumpled fax that, that came through that we, you know, got in, in, and put together. And you could immediately see that he had checked off basically, yes, 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 all the way through, added a couple of great comments. Bail Organa did this, and Leia was doing this, and it's like, oh my god, you know, this is the absolute source material for this great saga. It's like, oh my god, you know, this is the absolute source material for this great saga. Uh, for me, it was awesome to be able to take that fax in hand and go back to the team who had worked so hard on this, you know, for over a year and be able to say, this is it, guys. This is our story. This is our character. This is the use of the force that we're, we're championing. Let's go. Let's, you know, let's hit the ground and, and make this game.